Welcome. This is Ibali Logovuga, the comeback story. I'm Smoom Jigeliso, and I will be speaking with guests that have some of the most phenomenal stories you've ever heard. You know me from having written Tando Manana's autobiography, the Being a Black Springbok, the Tando Manana story, but I am here sitting with one of the most phenomenal young rugby players ever to come out of South Africa, Malungisa Giant Gorsi. Now, what you don't know about Malungisa is that coming out of Craven Week in 2005, he was the most promising rugby prospect in the whole of South Africa. And what a journey it was. And here he is today, the man that he is, running his own textile and clothing company. He's got his own brand. He's a different man altogether True. than the kid that was at the Golden Lions back in the day trying to make a life out of rugby. How was it playing rugby in Soweto? How did you guys even start or pick up rugby when there's so much soccer madness and so much soccer fever? Gotta well, you know, the, the typical uh, mindset that you need to have a big body, a big structure yeah. to play rugby. You know, so I was, that, I was that boy that I was tall and I had the body for it. So that's how it came about, me yeah. playing rugby. And yeah, the school I was at had the rugby, which is Chablan Technical High School. Didn't you feel awkward, though? What guys are like feeling awkward? A lot of guys want to play soccer, um, like, ah. No, no, no. You're going to play rugby. A lot of people were ignorant to the sports, to the game. Okay. Yeah, very, very ignorant. Uh, so it wasn't something that was people talking about or when you pass and they'll be like, hey, he's playing rugby. Ah, no, no, no. It, it wasn't like that. So you go from having picked up your first rugby ball at around 14, you make Grand Homo Week at under 16, which is, that puts you as one of the best provincial under-16 players in the Golden Lions region, which is Johannesburg. True. From there, you make the green squad, which yeah. is then what would be the best under-16 players in the country. In the country yeah. And then things just catch on to wildfire to that you make the Craven Week. You make yeah. Craven Week in rugby. And, and um, this, is, this is a point that one has to emphasize. If you make Craven Week playing rugby, you are regarded as the best under 18 player in, in the, the province, province. Yeah. and you're playing against the best under 18 players in the in other the 14 unions. Yeah. Did you foresee that in those four or five years you'd actually uh, take rugby that far? I didn't understand what it meant. <laughs> you know, to even yeah, make Kevin yeah. Week and making AC schools, I didn't understand. I was just enjoying playing the game and being away from home. Yeah, <laughs> just just so, enjoying going to play yeah, in different places, going to the leopards. Yeah, with the and, white people. Yeah. And then it was, it was huge for me then, you know. That was very, very exciting. You know, everything just came out nicely. Like, you get free kids, for <laughs> example. Yeah. And you get to tour, visit other provinces of yeah. which you didn't have that at home. At Craven Week, and I want to just talk to you about that Craven Week because it turned out to be the high point of your rugby True. career. True. You were the best Craven Week player of your age group. You got an award at the SA Rugby uh, uh, NDA Awards that year, 2005, yeah. and you got up on stage to receive the award. And that year was the year Brian Habana got his first um, SA Rugby Player of the Year award. sitting next to me. It's really? Yeah, tell tell me about that. the same table. Yeah. It was fun, you know. Being around all those people and sitting next to Brian Havana for one, end of which I looked up to him as mm. lot. So it was fun, man, more than anything. It was fun. It was just fun. It came with its challenges. What are some of those yeah, challenges? Yeah, it was, it was at Santin Convention Center mm. 2005. And at that time, I was at the boarding school at St. Stephen's College. Okay. And um, at home, we didn't have resources like for transport. Mm. There was no car and stuff like that. We had to borrow a car to come to the event of the awards yeah. uh, at Santin Convention Center. We used one of the teacher's car because she borrowed us and she understood what it meant. So she borrowed us and my friend who was a schoolmate who didn't have a license <laughs> to drive, you know. <laughs> so yeah. it, was, it, was, it was funny. Coming back from receiving that award, going back to the school and not going back at home and celebrating with my mom and 
the trophy, I had to put it in the cupboard, right? you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Close it there and... And don't yeah. touch it, leave it there. Yeah, yeah until yeah. like a week later when I went home on weekends, because we go home on weekends. When I went home on weekends, that was then. Only then they saw the trophy. Even yeah. them, they didn't know what it meant. Or I was even going to receive such an award, you know? Even the phone, I didn't even phone then. So it was, it was very, very challenging. And you were the first in your... Maybe in your township, even in let alone your, for that your family. <laughs> in Johannesburg, for that man, I was the to first one that, to receive that award. That yeah. award, yeah. yeah, which was incredible. I mean, uh, you're a lock forward, a position that is traditionally dominated by right. white players, mm. players that come from very privileged backgrounds. I mean, if mm. you look at the genetic makeup of an Eben Etzebeth, these are guys that probably grew up with some of the best nutrition that, that, that money well, can buy, um, or your um, Peter Steph tutorial. Yeah, I was a utility player. Mm. Uh, when I started, I started playing wing. Oh, really? I was, I was okay. that quick. <laughs> I, was that, I was that quick. Yeah. Never mind the body now, but yeah. Yeah, I was quick then. Tell me about how you felt about being at the Sharks Academy, um, which was the best academy in rugby at the time when you played around 2005, 2006. Yeah, I think even now they still are, eh? Yeah. yeah, the structures there are good. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, like I said, I didn't know much. I wasn't informed about the the, the, the sports and what it meant also mm. to be at the Sharks Academy. To me, it was a new phase, a new chapter, meeting new people and stuff like that. It's like your first day at school. Mm, mm. You know, you know you're know, going to this best school, but what comes with being at that best school, you didn't know. You only know when you're there. Mm. And uh, I didn't have family. Of friends mm. from that side, which was very hard as well. We are, uh, my first day, of my first time was at the rugby house where I had your JP Peterson, mm. Dustin Noble, and those guys were huge at that time. You know, mm. they were senior contracted with the Sharks. So to be in that system in the same house as them, it was, it was, it was, it was uncomfortable at some at some point when I started, and especially with the language barrier as well, Africans. Mm. Um, they spoke a lot of Africans, you mm. know, and um, I didn't know those guys personally. And to live with them, it was very, very challenging. Because yeah. you don't know what to expect. Um, yeah, you don't even know what to do, even though you had everything around you. You still don't know what to do with it. But all you know, all you know is just to play mm. and to make the most out of it. And yeah, it was, it was, it was hard. Now you were, at, at the time, you are the best young prospect of your age group, of your, of your generation. Then something happens that changes the trajectory of your, of your upward curve. You, you get hit by a car. Yeah. And you don't just get hit, you suffer severe bodily and, and brain injury. I was in ICU for two weeks. When it happened, the guys were away. I was coming back from an injury. I joined my ligament, ankle mm. ligament, ligament. So the guys were away on the camp. I couldn't join them. I stayed behind and I was training. So on weekends, you know, we have nothing to do. Mm. It was a thing of let's go and have drinks. And mm. yeah, it happened. an accident happened during that time at night. And I don't know how and what happened. I can't remember. I remember we were preparing to leave. But then the next thing I wake up in a coma. Jeez, bro. And yeah. this is 2006 before you get contracted. 2006, contract first weekend of August, yeah. You, you're about, at end of that year, I mean, you're in talks to become a senior at the Sharks yes. now. Yes, it was just before the Cape Cup started. Jeez. Yeah. And, and which is a huge, huge, huge platform for a rugby mm, player. Yeah, a massive, yeah, massive. It's a huge I mean, platform you, you talk about player. JP Peterson, who you played with, France Day, who you played with, they broke through. And True. in those curry cups True. you were supposed to Your play. Beast, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And, and you lost him for over this many of them, yeah. Then did you get any sort of support, SA rugby, um, the sharks maybe? And I know there's a Petro not Jackson ideally. fund as well. Not ideally. That deals with injured rugby not, players. Not ideally, not ideally. Try not ideally, hey. No, mm. the support from the Sharks was to ask me if I need a lawyer for the road fund. The road accident fund, yeah. Yeah, but then it was a matter of um, we're going to let your contract continue because I was still in the middle of my contract. I signed a two-year contract. Uh, it was going to end 2007. Mm. Yeah, so 
when I had an accident, it was 2006. So they told me that I'm gonna let you're gonna let your contract go. I mean, go and on, run on. Yeah. yeah, until the end of it, and then after that, that was it. it. Even during that time, I didn't have the support I needed from the sharks. It was just your monthly salary. What would you have liked, maybe the sharks or the or, or SA rugby to? Given the right resources and of the support structure, I would have done mm. more than just coach development team. What, 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 what did that incident really tell you about yourself and maybe just, just all around, not just rugby? It was a very rugby. confusing time, Maka. Even till now, I'm still confusing. I'm still, I'm still yeah. trying to make sense of why me and why it happened. But what it meant is that I couldn't take contact ever again. The rugby was the only thing I knew more than anything. Yeah, yeah and you were good at as well, that yeah. which is important. You yeah, know, it made yeah. you feel good to be and it's, good it's at something. It's sad that at that time, or even now, some players don't consider education more important than the game, because yeah. they're good at the game, and everything is presented to you. I mean, you're gonna play the Springboks, you're gonna play one, two, three, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna, then you don't really see the need of paying more attention into other stuff than just playing sports and being fit. Yeah. yeah. But somehow in all of that, you still manage to find something that I can tell just by looking at you gives you a lot of purpose and a lot of joy. Tell us about GP, going places. Uh, when I started the SOS, Teacher of Soweto Embroidery, mm. um, which is, this SOS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so um, it was, I needed something to do daily. Actually, when I thought of the, the company or the embroidery, I was at the club. Yeah. One club in Soweto, chilling alone there, and I was like, I need something to do. I can't live this life, you know. And then I was like, tomorrow I'm going to ask about the stitching right. and the garments. How did that come printing. about? Yeah, what yeah. is this thing? And that's when I get to learn more about embroidery and I uh, did my research um, and I went and bought the machine and yeah, I started rendering the services for embroidery okay. and I was in business then. And a year later, um, after that, 2017, beginning of 2017, that's when the brand was established, Okay. GP. So that's how it came about, going places. But yeah, you thought of going places. A lot of people think GP. They think gangsters paradise. They think that, that the spinning cars, the girls, the life, the money. The yeah, when you mentioned that, that's what I thought also when I, <laughs> I had to come up with the meaning for GP, what it yeah. stands for. And but going like, places, things even bigger, things more positive. Yeah, I mean, for the impact. fact that I've been around, I've learned a lot of cultures, I've been overseas. A mm. couple of countries, you've learned a lot from that, and that actually helped you personally to grow. And yeah, does it sustain you um, at least so you can make a, a decent living? We all gotta live at the end of the well, day. Well, it's got its own challenges. I mean, the business, you know, the business, it, it fluctuates and, and stuff. Yeah. It's not always constant or always going up. And where, and where can people sort of find this? Yeah. Well, right now I don't have a point of sale, yeah. which is another challenge for me now. Right, right. Uh, but it's working out best for me because I sell from the boot. Okay. You know, I can sell you a cap anywhere you can think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a yeah. toilet, in a traffic, <laughs> in a roadblock. Even yeah. to now I've got celebrities that one that are wearing GP, mm. and there's a lot of people that are gonna wear GP. But because of the access to the brand, where can we buy? Where can we buy? Those kind of questions. Yeah, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. it, becomes, it becomes hard for them to get it because we're not that easily accessible. But on your social mm -hmm. media that platforms, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very, very active there. I'm inspired yeah. by how you've managed to overcome some of the biggest odds, bro. Um, yeah, and the, the, there's one other highlight that I, that I always like to tell people. Yeah. When we went to the World Cup, Yes, yo, coming from Soweto, uh, it's it's going to the under nineteen World amazing. Cup, yeah, it's and uh, and the Lofi Yellow, awesome, mm, yeah, mm. Eugene Love, it's very short guy. <laughs> it was very very fun, you know, and a yeah. um, lot of people don't understand what it meant. Right. Even my family and my extended family didn't know what it meant. Um, um, didn't even know that I'm chosen to be in the under nineteen World Cup to even go play in Dubai. Mm. Then that is going to be televised, and a lot of people didn't know. Even my family didn't watch, 
and coming back, flying back with Emirates Airline, mm. business class. Mm. Lovers. I mean, it, was, <laughs> it was very, very exciting, yeah. you know, and coming back to uh, our time, I remember very well, there were fans, other families of my teammates, provincial people, um, but there was no one from my family, no one from my friends' cycle. Um, yeah, it was just the people and the friends, and I had to figure out, okay, how do I get home from here? I took a taxi from Ortambo to Carlton Center. You, you just know, sat in a taxi in your foot, in a taxi number and one. sitting for four there, you know, Crazy. and it was, it was another experience. And coming back home, getting off of the taxi, like no one. It's just people living their own life and doing their own things. But you'd expect people to waiting for you mm. to give you that home welcome and it was nothing coming back home just like any other day my brother is there my mom is at work it's an unbelievable story and thank you so much for sharing it no, malungisa thank you. giant ngosi man it's the kind of story that you wish could get told more and more it's the kind of story you want to tell to kids malungisa is a kind of guy it's happy to chat does not want to see the same things happen to future generational rugby players or, or in any other profession for that matter. But I think what I will take from this is there's, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and that light isn't a train. That light is actually a glimmer of hope and if you take nothing from this is that you can always do something because you're always going places. I'm Sboom Jigeliso and this is Ibali Logovuka. My guy. Thank you so much, brother, man.